Elizabeth Kaiser. I am the co-owner of Mad Law Media. We do video production here in Savannah. I am pleased to introduce this session, Technology in the Craft of Filmmaking. Sorry guys, I made a block in there. We will hear short presentations from three speakers who are using amazing technology in their companies. Should there's only two speakers. Excellent. Uh, we have Pat Long's uh, Fantastic. Uh, he's the director at Ready Made VFX. And uh, we also have Julio Salateria. <laughs> <laughs> director of film production at Alien Works. Um, and to help us navigate these sessions smoothly, our MC is Creative Post board member and founder of Sirlandia Supply, Clinton Edmonds. Edmonds. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Well. Thank you. Enjoy. All right, thank you. Okay, everybody, again, my name is Clint Edminster, um, and I will be helping uh, just sort of make sure that we keep on time, um, make sure that nobody talks for too long, um, and that this drone doesn't fly away and take me with it, because it can literally lift me up, which is kind of scary. Um, so that's my position here today. Uh, but mainly, I'm just going to try to talk as little as possible and uh, start with these two. So who is going to start? You're going first. All right, I'm just going to go with you. Let's go. All right, no, I'm good. All right. Um, yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Julio Saldarriaga. <laughs> <laughs> um, I um, I work uh, uh, with Alien Works. Uh, uh, Mark, uh, my partner, started the company like four years ago. I joined uh, him uh, two years ago, and uh, he started as a drone company. So the first kind of like the first big uh, introduction to the film industry was for him to fly a little, well not so little, but a medium-sized drone for birth of a nation, birth of a nation. So that was a, a very important, uh, I kind of established a little bit the, um, uh, the, the beginnings of Alien Works as the uh, first uh, local 600, which is the union for film uh, camera uh, workers. And, um, and it was very important to become, to be the first one be certified FFA and, and be also you know uh, supported by the union. Uh, from that point on, Mark was working on every single film that was coming uh, to town and all the projects. Also, you know, we also do industrial work. And and um, and I joined him two years ago to help grow the company a little bit and extend that services. You know, the, the film industry was just growing and it was becoming kind of an opportunity for business. Um, and technology gave us that kind of extra um, advantage over everybody because the industry had more into a very technical, technological advance uh, with the new cameras that were coming out, the new processes, um, and, and with the drones. So it required to have this technical advancement. So when Hollywood started coming to the South, and especially specifically to Savannah, uh, we found that they were looking for people that had a little bit of that knowledge and, and, and had the, the willing to step up and, and start competing at the level that they usually have either in Los Angeles or New York. And, um, and, and one of the things, one of our, our first, uh, uh, the first opportunity that came to us was with Amazon. Amazon was uh, planning to do a couple of, of projects here in Savannah and and I knew of a place. So the, the first the first thing they asked was internet. It's like, well, we all have internet, but there was nobody here in the area that will understood what would the needs of the film industry were. Which they just need short term leases and short term services. They just want to pay for on demand service, and and we were able to kind of like understand that. Talk to became kind of like an intermediary between the service providers, or the standard service providers for the internet and, and rental spaces. And uh, we became that buffer where we took kind of like the responsibility of taking like long terms. But when we went to, to work with the film industry, uh, the productions were very happy because we were flexible, doing prorated, and, and trying just to give it exactly what they needed without trying to oversell anything or trying to up, upsell any other services or any other commitments. So. So that, that helped us a little bit, and, and um, after that, we were very lucky to, out of, um, because we had that already in place to have Gemini Man, 
the movie that is just released the trailer um, with Will Smith and Ang Lee to use our services. We literally move into a closet. The only thing that the closet had was a fiber optics internet that we could open the faucet and go to 10 gig in, in a day or two. So they came to us and said, we were so excited, it's like, oh my God, we're gonna work with these people. It's like, no, you, we're only gonna use your space. You guys just stay in that corner. You can not even look at the screens. We're like, oh, damn. So, but it was fun to interact with them and, and know that Weta, which is a Peter Jackson company out of New Zealand, was doing all the VFX, and we were literally interacting with them and helping them, making them feel comfortable, making them feel at home, and, and that grew into more business out of that same project, because then when the movie went to other countries, uh, they still needed some sort of a bridge between that's all, those other countries and the rest of the United States, and, and, and whatever they're doing, whatever they're doing the post and the VFX. So they still kept using our, 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 our place. So we got paid really well just for letting somebody to just squash in our place. So it was, it was great. Um, so one of the things that I, that I do that have helped us as a business to grow thanks to technology is, is the DAT. DAT stands for Digital uh, Image Technician. Um, we are literally on set uh, the quality control people. We make sure that the image is being captured exactly to the specifics and the standards, certification and standards of the studio and the creative standards of the DP and the director. So we kind of become a, this epicenter on set. So um, one of the fun things is like when we're here uh, working with these famous people that, that come, uh, actors and, and, and things like that, there's a lot of PAs, there's a lot of people that is for the first time they're coming into the film industry and it's a great opportunity for them to like learn and, and see uh, how movies are made. So um, a lot of those people come to me and say, dude, who are you? Why are you so important? Everybody's hanging around you. It's just not, it's not that you're that I'm important, it's that they wanna see how their movies are looking. <laughs> so at, at the end of the day is, is, is becoming more like, like technology becomes a little bit more of, of an intric intricate part of, of this filmmaking. And, and you have these amazing uh, directors of photography and, 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 and cameramen that, that create these amazing images. And they're used to do it on cellular. And it was a more physical uh, thing. And, and there was a lot of, you really needed a lot of talent in order to make those pictures to look like they're supposed to look like without seeing anything. They didn't even have a reference, they had video reference of those pictures, but it was like, it was a standard the definition. It was not even high quality or anything like that. It was just to see the framing was right and the focus was okay, but then they didn't know what the color was looking like or what was the, you know, like exposure. So uh, one, one of the things was um, with, with the new cameras and the new, uh, the new technology uh, with the red, camera, uh, one of the things that technology did for us was kind of like democratizing the, film, the filmmaking part of it. So now if, if you have a camera um, that is fairly cheap and, and you're able to do 4K and you have a story to tell, then, then now you can do it and then almost complete at the same level. Because right now, thanks to color correction and, and, and all these, these aspects, you can actually make it look like the same look as, as they did on the movie. So um, I want to I wanna, um, I wanna show something that we did as a company was very important for us. Like, all right, so we're growing as a company, but how we grow as an industry here locally. And it was very important to start um, uh, reaching out to the other professionals, uh, reaching out to um, other uh, uh, companies that were trying to cater to the film industry. And we say, hey, well, why would we get together Let's put all technology and everything that we have to offer, uh, and let's try to come up with a, a project that will showcase the talent, that will showcase uh, the beauty of Savannah and everything, all the uh, logistics, what all all the things that we can offer. So we set out to do the most crazy thing. It was okay. Well, let's do a short film, um, and let's do it in five days, and let's so from writing it to filming. It was just the month of January. And, and it was very specific because 
we're gonna get busy with other works and other jobs. And we said, we only have January. January is kind of like a, like a, a slow month for, for almost every industry, especially for ours. And then we said, well, it's the only time that we have, so we have to do it. So we came up with this little uh, uh, project. I wanna show it to you guys a little bit of the trailer. Um, and, then, and then if I still have time, I might show you guys a little bit of, of what the DAT color correcting type of, of, of work I do kind of on set sometimes, all right? So here we go. So one uh, one thing um, that I I use a very specific software. There's a there's multiple softwares that we use in the industry. There is a there's called something called LightRate um, that is used when uh, we literally kind of like change and manipulate color as it's being shot. We don't wait after the fact. We do adjustments after the fact, but right there at the same time where they're filming and they, they're making those decisions, I'm sitting with the, with the DP, the director of photography, kind of like going through um, what looks best, with, you know, he wants to like more contrasty and, and, and kind of like tweaking a little bit as he's also doing the real life setting up lights and stuff like that. So it's, um, it's very interesting to be part of that, that little uh, creative process and, and uh, is, is very technically. So one of the one of the other softwares that are very common and is becoming a very popular software because of the price point is DaVinci DaVinci Resolve. Um, you also allow the pay version, which I think is only three hundred bucks or, or something like that. Uh, the pay version would allow you to do light grading as well. So uh, right now we're not set up right now to show you how light grading uh, works, but it's very similar. It's just the difference is instead of having that image right there in the middle, it's, uh, I'll, well, um, if, if, if um, instead of having that just a clip, it is literally just the feed directly from the camera coming into my system, then I do the processing. Then I have something called what is color boxes that outputs the color decision that I made with the DP. And then that color goes to the to the their producers and director. So they're always watching what we are, uh, where we're manipulating or where we're filming. So so one of the things, like for example, you look at that image and that image look washed out. And then and that's what we call an image that is on log, um, or you know, also in the industry it's called raw. Is an image shot in raw. Right now, what you guys are seeing is uh, a six K. 
uh, footage from red from the red camera. And as you see, one of the things where this equipment is so kind of big and bulky is because it's kind of like a, a lab on wheels that we can take anywhere to any location and, and be able to either play back real time. So right now we're seeing real time um, 6K red footage unprocessed. it. This is untouched. This is like how the camera will literally uh, um, has captured it. So one of the things what, what the cameras capture is trying to maximize the, the, the range in terms of the information. So they capture a lot of information. So we have all, you have all these in the industry we call stops, where you have all these stops, uh, that means it's, it's the amount of light or manipulation that you have. You know, either if you overexpose or underexpose. So you're able to like move up and down. So right now the image has all that information. So now I have to, trans to translate that image into something that is pleasing to the eye. And, and, and then there's two, two ways to do it. Obviously, I can take the image and quickly, using my cold, cold, cold control panel, I can start giving it a little bit of contrast, give it this, and then, well, but still, still, still so pale, Julio. So we can go and do a, some saturation. Uh, let me try to give it a little bit. So then we, we can do, uh, before and after, uh, so that's how it was captured by the camera, and then we make it a little bit, you know, to 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 make it look uh, um, more pleasing to the eye. And the monitors that we have on set are not as sophisticated as the monitors that we have on post production. So we have to like literally dumb down the image a little bit so those monitors on set can process and 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 create the pleasing image that the director of photography is intended that look that they wanna they wanna give. Um, so there so the last so the last thing is um, you know production is very hectic. So we do something called lots, uh, lookup tables. Those are literally kind of like plug-in uh, color palettes that we save prior to going to production. And we use those. So it's basically shooting. So it's not like I have to do all this coloring thing live where they're like in the middle of a shooting a scene where cars are flying and, and, and things are happening very fast and very hectic. So we use little templates called uh, LUTs. And then I'm able to immediately affect the image just by clicking on it and create different looks and different, um, different moods, you know, because there is a scene that they need to be cold because they're sad or there are scenes that need to be warm, so we, we play with color, and it's, it's, also, it's all about emotion. So I think that's it. I am, uh, I'm running out of time, and um, I thank you very much, guys. And Thank you. That's fascinating. All right. And that's all running on this machine? Yeah, it's all running on, on this guy. Uh, we, a uh, little bit of the anatomy of the DAT card is, it's a very sturdy card, like, like we can, you know, take it anywhere. Um, we have a computer, a Max Out Mac Pro. And then we have, we have it in case on, um, like, like it's an extended uh, expansion card, basically. It's, you know, obviously those, those, those computers, you know, one of the things that you couldn't put any more cards or anything inside. So the industry came out with, expansion uh, chassis. And then what we put it there, then we connect a bunch of other cards that we use to output the video, to process the media, and, and to manage all the storage. Because that's the other, the other important aspect of, of the D18 is also um, you know, uh, backing up the media safely. So we kind of like a little bit of also, once they finish the, 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 the filming with that specific card, they bring it to us. We put those, uh, those, those clips in our system and do a, a bunch of backups as we also process in images for post-production and, and producers somewhere on, around the world. Uh, well, are you gonna, you're going to be at lunch with these, with these, yeah, these the big, suckers the, over here? Yeah, the big, the big boys. That's, uh, that's the DNA of Alienworks. It's, uh, it's drones, and we're going to be showcasing them uh, after lunch uh, at the drone I don't know how you call it, the drone showcase. The drone lunch? <laughs> the drone lunch. We call it that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, Groovy. Thank you again. All right, man. That's Thank fascinating. You.
Thank you. Um, I think what's kind of interesting about this talk too is that we've got uh, sort of like two different aspects of, of what um, filmmaking has sort of turned into today. There's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of changes happening um, in how technology wow. is changing both okay. the production side, um, and that's clearly what Julio is working on, but then also Pat Longstreth has been working on sort of the behind the scenes, visual effects, which may or may not include any aspects of, uh, of, of sort of actual film being filmed somewhere, um, which he's about to show us here quickly. Um, so yeah, I would say the name of the game is that things are changing in filmmaking and tech um, is a big driver of that. So I'll let you go, and uh, yeah. So Thank after this, then we'll have some questions. All right. Yeah, as, uh, as Clinton said, uh, I uh, kind of merged the real and digital world together with my work. And uh, let me pull up my presentation here. Uh, so, um, oh, we're working on the monitor. There we go. And, uh, so, again, uh, I'm. Patrick Longstress, and uh, the name of this panel, as you guys might know, is Technology and the Craft of Filmmaking. But as I was putting these slides together last night, um, for my portion of it, I thought of a maybe better name. Um, so I used my marker to kind of scratch this out, and uh, I thought, uh, I'm calling my part Crafting the Future with Film and Technology. And uh, you'll kind of see what I mean by that in a moment. So, uh, have any of you guys played this game in the past? Anybody know the name of it? SimCity. Sim City. Okay, yeah. So, I used to spend many hours playing SimCity when I was a kid. And uh, a year ago, I got to start to um, play SimCity uh, in real life for my job, and it was really fun. Um, so, uh, Georgia Ports came to me and my team, and they told us, uh, we want to increase capacity by 40% in the next 40 year or in the next 10 years. And so I thought, how are we gonna, you know, condense 10 years of construction and expansion into a two minute video? So here's uh, what we came up with. So Clinton mentioned the music is dramatic, and it's funny uh, that you say that because I was going to say that was a really important part that we picked out the music before we even started filming, so that we could plan each of these shots and figure out, you know, okay, is a, is a four or five second shot going to work to show, you know, the Ma Mason rail yard, or do we need ten seconds at the end for that final thing? So, um, so we built a storyboard, 
and, uh, and, and, and put it to the music before we even started. So uh, again, just to kind of reintroduce, I'm Patrick Longstreth. I work as a director and a visual effects uh, artist and supervisor. And on this video and, and most of these, all of these projects that I've been doing the last couple of years, I've been working exclusively with Mehmet Kajin, who is uh, also a director and co-director on this project and producer. And so without him as a producer, I wouldn't have even had the opportunity to, to do this project. And uh, his company is Blue Voyage Productions and uh, they, they're full service film production. And so uh, we kind of work well together, he, him in the film and uh, um, you know, everything from documentaries to um, uh, corporate videos to, uh, and then uh, me with my green screen and digital computer graphics experience. Um, this is the team that put th that video together. Uh, on the left, we've got Kenny, uh, our drone operator. Uh, he's very talented. Uh, Kate uh, Veneman, she was a uh, visual effects artist. She's still at SCAD at the moment, um, but she uh, did some great work with me and got to go on set that day. Uh, there's Mehmet in the middle there, me, uh, Jason Piccolo, our, our, one of our producers, uh, who's also you know, essential on all of these projects, and Sai Ram uh, Vanamu, who's now back in India, but he graduated from SCAD, and uh, he did some great work with uh, 3D modeling and texturing on all the models that you saw there. Um, and uh, sometimes they let me fly the drone, uh, but I'm not very good, so I try to leave that up to the professionals. Uh, this is about as far as I get to go with the drone, actually. Um, but you can see I have a little headset on there, so I can actually see what the drone is seeing uh, in, in, my, in uh, you know, my sunglasses there. And it's, uh, it's a pretty fun experience. Maybe, are you guys gonna have the, the VR glasses for the drone show? No. Line of sight. Okay, okay. But you guys pr probably have those, right? The, yeah. the glasses? Yeah, a lot of people have them now, and uh, they're, they're really fun. They might make you a little motion sick if you're not careful. Um, so here's a few other projects we've done in the last two years. Uh, we started off with the, the Mega Rail video for the Georgia Ports uh, 2017 uh, State of the Port, uh, and we did a video for the Brunswick uh, expansion uh, last fall. We did a video for this Gateway Industrial Hub that's over in Effingham. Uh, we did a video for CETA for the Savannah Mac Manufacturing Center, um, the proposed site. Uh, we did uh, another video for uh, uh, the Tri-County Global Industrial Site in South Carolina, uh, visualizing uh, this, this electric co-op they've got there. And then uh, we just finished a little short video, an interactive piece for the airport, which I'll show you at the end of the presentation here, um, kind of uh, visualizing how we could uh, you know, improve traffic flow at that I-95 intersection, which I'm sure everyone's been stuck in at some point. <laughs> um, and uh, just as a side note, Mehmet and I went to Uganda a couple weeks ago, and we had a lot of fun filming uh, documentary uh, short videos uh, about to compost to toilets. So, uh, if any, I just put that in there in case anyone here is interested in toilet technology. Come talk to me about that later because uh, it's <laughs> something I'm now passionate about. Um, so I, this all got started for me in 2008. I, I had already been working in um, film or, or mostly television. Uh, I was working at NBC News doing um, like 2D motion graphics. And uh, there were two images that changed my life. Um, there was this one and uh, then there was this one. And uh, these were taken at a company in Baltimore called Direct Dimension. And I, I just uh, was lucky enough to go there and hang out for a few hours and they showed me how they do things. And uh, through uh, a little software they had built, uh, they were able to take those two images and immediately create a 3D image. And this is called photogrammetry. And I'm gonna show you uh, the software here real quick at the risk of you know, interrupting my presentation. But um, this is uh, what happens when those two images come together. You get a, a 3D image. And uh, this really totally blew my mind 10 years ago. And then in addition to that 3D image, you've got a very high resolution photo that's projected right onto that image. So you can get you know, right in there and see, well, th there's some imperfections, obviously. You can see uh, my eyes a little flat. But that's where you know, a 3D modeler can come in and touch things up. Um, but it can really speed up the process of 
creating models and textures. Um, and this process can be used for, from a drone to uh, create a whole topography map and image. And so when you, watch, when you go on Google Earth, I'm sure many of you have been on Google Earth, this is kind of how they do Google Earth, with, through uh, images and photogrammetry. It's, it's no longer uh, what it used to be with LiDAR scans, um, which is just lasers that have to sit there and scan a static scene. You know, this can be moving. Like if I, if I were trying to sit there still while a laser scanned me, uh, it would come out all fuzzy because I'd be moving just a little bit here and there. But this is one picture taken instantly and creates a 3D image. So this is something I became passionate about and uh, very interested in. And uh, I decided to go back to school in 2008. Um, let's see here. From current slide, Where? back on one. Oh, there it is, okay. So, um, takes a minute. Takes a, takes a moment, yeah. yeah. Um, let's just say that, yeah, because I noticed that was better. So, uh, I decided to move from Washington, D.C. Oh, also, in 2008, uh, Benjamin Button came out, and this was a really amazing use of this technology. Not so much the photogrammetry, but the 3D modeling and face replacement and, uh, you know, again, the name of this panel is Film and Technology, so I thought I'd include a film just to kind of remind you um, how all this is being integrated and used. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I went back to SCAD and then uh, now I get to work with these really cool 3D models like a train and a ship and cranes and trucks and all the cool stuff I played with as a kid. And uh, I get to go to the port and take pictures for reference uh, of these trains. And we use these pictures for textures even. We're able to use a, just a shot like this I take of the ground to figure out uh, the size of these planks and how much rust might be on you know, the train tracks. Or maybe there's a little shiny part on top where the trains normally go. Um, I take th photospheres like this. Of my with my phone, well it went away. But um, oh gosh, well Windows. start over. Yeah, God, Lee, what was my time anyway? Uh, oh, like 12 minutes. Well, um, I suppose I could switch over to Julio's computer, <laughs> or maybe it'll just like start up again. That's sad. I guess this isn't a very good endorsement for Windows. We were going to have uh, me do the, I'm the Windows guy, or I'm the PC and Hello, he's a Mac. Mac. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah, that cannot happen yeah. on set for me, so I have to. <laughs> that, that is true. Um, you know what? While this is starting up here, I guess we could give it a well, we second. We could sort of move into uh, like a bit of a conversation. You want to do a Q&A? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of &A, uh, &A, I just wanted to pull up one interactive piece. All right. uh, so we could, we could do a Q&A, &A, and then when that's up, I'll, yeah. I'll show it that. to you. Let's do that. We'll I think we've got on. plenty of time. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. So yeah. Great job. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, but sure. We've got, and it, I think it's really important that you do show everybody what you did want yeah, to I show. Yeah, I did get them, to show Clinton. That Clinton is, seen it, yeah. uh, I think, a, a really interesting next evolution of how we share and consume media that, frankly, I hadn't really seen a lot before, and I thought it was really quite impressive. Oh, cool. um, so, basically, what I'd like to ask you guys is this conversation is about technology and filmmaking. Um, how is technology making it easier? for businesses in Savannah to be successful in the filmmaking industry? And I'll let either of you guys answer that question. Yeah. Um, um, well, it, it, it gave us um, the opportunity to, um, to fill the void of, uh, because production, at the end of the day, they're trying to maximize uh, and uh, maximize cost, even though they spend millions and millions of dollars. Uh, and then there's some productions that they don't have the budget to bring everybody from Los Angeles or from, from New York. Uh, so there was a, there's that, that opportunity that technology it come, becomes a bridge where, yes, maybe we don't have the experience of those guys that have been working on all the Marvel movies in LA, but because we have this technology and we know really well have what to do with it, then they gave us the opportunity and then we step up and, and, he, and, and he, it makes it, it makes it uh, um, 
it makes it uh, uh, more um, like, like, you know, it's, it's definitely easier. Um, it, it's just embrace it. You, you know, you have to embrace the technology. You have to, you cannot um, doubt it. You have to, uh, and, and, and you have to prepare yourself. You know, it is, it is at the end of the day, it, it requires the skill for you to learn it and practice on it. Uh, because when the opportunity comes, there's no, there's no time to fail. Like they're like either you're on or you know, you have to be on. Now, there's no like, oh, let me see if it works. No, it has to. You have to project so much confidence to these producers because they're used to that in in the in the big markets. So when they come here, you just have to you know fake it until you make it. I guess. <laughs> yes. Are we at that point in Canada where they're now coming here knowing that's here, or are you still having to tell them? Uh, it's a little little baby steps. Right, um, um, I we still have that stigma that there's no one here, and then they have to bring everybody. So uh, breaking that ceiling, for example, for us as a company, I travel every year for three months to LA to do a big TV show down there. So when they come here and they ask, so who's available? Who, who you know? Oh, you just finished a show in Los Angeles. Also, oh, you must know more than anybody or like you know you, you, yeah so a little by little it, it's been taking uh, a while um, you know very thankful to the film office that they've been doing such a great job uh, there's still a lot of things that could be done you know um, a, a, when these big productions come in it would be great for example to have a, a working lunch or like a presentation like this for these producers where you know they're going to take time to read anyway, so at least they have a chance to, to know what, what, what you know, uh, capabilities that uh, we have here in town. So, well, to also kind of add to that, and, uh, and maybe mm -hmm. it seems that... Yeah, I have a different perspective from Post, uh, or, or, uh, where I would say that uh, technology and just the accessibility of faster internet and, uh, you know, file sizes and online storage, cloud storage, has really made it easier for me to be here in Savannah. And, that, and that's one of the reasons I moved from Los Angeles to Savannah, because um, I still have clients that I work with in LA and New York and uh, Istanbul, but uh, we can, I can work remotely and uh, we can transfer files back and forth and we can review progress very easily and, and screen share. And uh, I can also hire people that are outside of Savannah, and uh, it's it's really a whole new world that didn't it wasn't possible ten years ago. People, and it, it wasn't even just the technology ten years ago. It was that my clients and and my customers weren't um, and and the audience uh, wasn't comfortable with that workflow yet. But everyone's becoming more comfortable with it. So. Uh, it's, it's great. It's very good. It also seems that your clients are not in Savannah, and they need you to be that Savannah connection, whereas your clients, uh, at least the ones with Georgia Port and mm -hmm. CETA, are specifically, CETA and Georgia Port are realizing there's a sophistication that they need to hit, mm -hmm. and it needs high-quality video, and you're able to provide that locally, mm -hmm. which is sort of like, these are two d very different types of clients um, that you both are providing services for, and kind of you know, relatively the same, but different fields. Mm -hmm. We had a question back here. Yes. Hi, Patrick. Yes. Um, I'm, not a film, I'm not in film, but I am in your experience in mine. And oh, I really cool. like the way you changed your title to Crafting the Future. <laughs> yeah. In technology, and it kind of made me excited, you know, at the idea of how we can envision the future with technology. And I was wondering if you had any like, more projects based off of that theme. Yeah, this one right here that I'm about to show you as soon as I use the city of Savannah's yeah, Wi-Fi to, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great question. And uh, that's exactly something that I've been thinking about a lot the last year especially. Um, and, uh, you know, there's this, this WebGL is a really interesting new thing. And, it, and I just discovered it a few months ago. It's a Java-based... Um, 3D rendering, so you can view 3D models and 3D scenes and in animations right in any web browser. Um, and right now, you know, there's a lot of people who play online games, but usually you have to download some sort of software, or you know, you have to do something. So this this will open up possibilities for, um, you know, uh, just just things being readily available. 
so as you saw with that um, airport video, at least, uh, oh, oh, you didn't see the airport video. So let me show you real quick the video piece we did for this. So then you can see, it's only a minute long. And then I'll show you the, uh, the interactive here. Um, well, you know, that'll probably take a minute. I'll just play this. So, so point is, this is a link I can send to anyone. And I, I press the play here, and it takes a moment to load, depending on the size of the scene here. Um, but I had already had this 3D model built. Uh, but I didn't have like a Google terrain or anything. So I went on to Google, and I just stole a bunch of images, essentially. And I modeled the terrain myself. And then I built this um, kind of uh, you know, tour, 3D tour. Uh, so th they had uh, four different options for the interchange. One was to widen the lanes. Uh, the second one was this diverging diamond where the lanes uh, cross over each other. And then uh, there's the single point interchange, which it also crosses over, but a little different. And then these flyovers, north and south. I showed this to my um, stepfather, who's a truck driver. He said, oh, that, that's the best one. Get him to do that. And I was like, well, that's also the most expensive one. <laughs> but, um, so you know, I can send this to the people at the airport and whoever they're talking to. And then they can, oh, uh-oh, well, never mind. They can, uh, you know, they can move around the scene. And, and, you know, I'm not an engineer. I'm not like, a, you know, a, um, uh, what, you know, an urban planner, although I'm starting to become one a little bit. And, uh, you know, but it's really exciting for me to even be involved in something like this and, and have my hand on it a little bit um, and, and, again, help craft the future and even the potential of, like, the, the area where I live. It's very exciting. Um, so... Does that answer your question, or, or do you have any other ideas? Okay, okay. Well, well, I would say that my next point where I was going to go with that in my presentation is that, you know, thinking about SimCity and, uh, you know, the goggles uh, that I had on through the drone, I, I was thinking um, what's going to be like when we have blockchain technology and you can track these containers um, as they come into the port, and you can even track the things inside the containers. And what if we could take that information and pipe it into, you know, animated 3D scenes that update in real time, where you can be, you know, again, flying a drone and looking, being like, okay, yeah, that's, I, I can see with some augmented reality information, like, there's the, you know, the flow of my products. Um, and uh, it could be, it could be for, for people operating at the port, or it could be for the CEO who wants to know where things are going, or it could be for the clients in China that want to know where their shipment is at. So um, I just think it's really unlimited right now, and there's a lot, I, I don't even know if like, uh, our imaginations can understand what might come in the next you know, 10, 20 years. Um, do you want, you want to answer Mehmet back there? <laughs> yes. So actually, just a comment from uh, just Patrick and I have been working on this for a while, and the beauty of this is um, it's right here in Savannah. I mean, like you know, we experienced some VR uh, possibilities here in Savannah. Um, this company that creates, and these are not the company; they're like you know, uh, Skydrags who just got it together and uh, creates this concept of VR. And uh, of course, they're positioning themselves into the gameplay and, and the gaming industry where we're seeing it as a um, different way to tell a story for a co corporate technology perspective. Um, what's happening is, as you said, you know, like how to implement these to the uh, user uh, base. Um, correct, that is one of the things that we are having a roadblock. Um, because we have this technology, we have a lot of capacity, but the decision makers right now are not understanding how to utilize it. So, you know, we are proposing a lot of, you know, interactive VR experience to the clients, and the clients are scratching their head because they're not there yet. Right now, the C-level people who are making decisions, they're just the video people. You know, they were not that. They were more like, uh, give me a handout, and give me a power presentation. Now the C-level decision makers who are writing the big checks are video people, but they're not interactive yet. 
So I'm thinking like in maybe in the 10 years, they are going to have this interactive imagination and they are going to be able to do that. So there's still some time for them to adapt. Well, it kind of seems like that's kind of the beauty of video and visuals, either static or moving or 3D or real. And I think kind of uh, like the the short film that you guys created um, as sort of a package to say, this is what Savannah can do, these are the things we're capable of, we have drones, we can do color correction, we've got actors, we've got sets, we've got studios, we've got costume designers, is, is a great way to package uh, a lot of information and deliver it to somebody. And I feel like you're doing the same with this. This is a tremendous amount of information and you're packaging it up and making it visually you know, interesting and exciting for somebody to, to learn. What is your plan with the with the short film? Is that a, is it to kind of just get it out there? Uh, well, the whole the whole idea was there's the, when you're making a short film, you you have two options. Either you do a brilliant piece of work that's gonna win a lot of awards, or you end up with a really good trailer. So I think <laughs> we're in the second one. So the the, the concept is is entice investors, mm -hmm. then give them the uh, the ease of mind that hey, we have talent here. Um, we are working constantly trying to, um, to get the, the stories to, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and we need a little bit more, there's a lot more work that needs to be done uh, making uh, the writers and the creators kind of like come together with us, the producers and directors to, um, to kind of like uh, uh, offer the complete package so, so production companies or, or streaming services can come and say, hey, we want to plan the flag in Savannah and do content for for, for a platform. So that's the dream, that's, that's what we guarantee. Uh, and, and the most important thing is that uh, it's not just one company, it's not just one person. Uh, as you see on the, on the end credits of every movie or every project, it's a, it's a lot of people that, to t that takes uh, to make one of these um, movies. So it is the same, it's like, like we are here, we all should be working together and, and, and complementing each other because that's the way we're going to grow the film industry here in Savannah. Anybody know how much time we've got? We've, say that again? 12 minutes. We've got 12 minutes? Great. Um, are there any more questions up here? Yes. Yeah, there, there is, um, the, right now the Georgia, uh, Georgia Tech, no, the um, technology, Savannah Tech, right. uh, has a program that uh, it is kind of intertwined with the film industry where if you go there, you can take classes and they will train you on different uh, uh, traits and, and, um, for the film industry and then they actually will place you on projects, on films. And, and that's how you start getting your, kind of like your, uh, um, let's say, your experience. Um, that's one, that, that's one way to do it. The other way is um, using the tools. Like um, uh, there's a very famous director who just came up with a movie, a really good one, by the way. Um, I think it was Steve, uh, Steven Soderbergh who came up with a movie done on, a, on an iPhone. So, uh, there's no limitations today. Uh, like if, if the big names in Hollywood are using these small tools, it is, at the end of the day, it's a story. So if you have a story to tell, it's like it, it, there's a lot of uh, software, for example, that is available. Like the Da Vinci has a free version that you can download and, and almost do everything and, and become very proficient on it. So when that opportunity comes along, either through the SCAD students that are doing films or through other people that are in town that wanted to do um, their own projects, then you will already have the skills to come out and say, hey, I know this software, I can help either doing color correction or editing or doing a, uh, some VFX or, or, um, or something like that. But there, there, I think uh, the, the only limit right now is ourselves. Like there's unlimited capabilities and possibilities for us to go out there and, and, and grab a little piece of that pie especially with you know, Disney and Apple and everybody else coming out with uh, streaming services, then they, there's a lot of content they're gonna need. You know? It's true, the, the trial versions of software are so accessible now yeah. for students or people learning. And um, you know, when I was getting started, I had to get a job somewhere and really get a lot of people coffee and, get, and work my way in at night to 
get a little bit of time on the edit machine. Oh, same, same, same and, here. Yeah, uh, I'm sure you had that same experience. Well, I had to but, wait everybody yeah. going and yeah. we'll go on the weekends and, exactly. and have the suite for myself. I'm like, now what I do? Because there's like, <laughs> it's so complicated right? back then. Yeah, yeah, there's no one to show you what to do when yeah. you're there on the weekend. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but now you can just learn at home and there's uh, tutorials on YouTube yeah, that there the never YouTube, used to be. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. there's a lot of, um, I, I'm, I'm very, um, uh, I, I like the tutorials that are on, on, uh, on YouTube and stuff like that, but there's nothing like reading the manual of the product, like knowing what makes the product tick, like knowing it inside, inside out, because sometimes on the tutorials you just learn a way of doing something, but if you don't know why the software does that or how it works, then you won't be able to create your own workflows. Or, or if you are presented with a situation that, oh, dude, that was not on the tutorial, so, you know, that's, that's like, I think for me, it's also very important, like, and actually that's free. You can actually almost download any, any manual. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did y'all ever use Blender? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I played with I Blender. Blender. Yeah, Blender's a, good, a great one. They were the first 3D software to go completely open source, you know. And so there's a lot of uh, high school students I know that know Blender. Um, and there's a, it's being used on a lot of feature films and TV shows too. There was actually, that's yeah. part of the reason I ended up uh, like coming down to Savannah was there was a, I was a big blender geek in high school and I would make all these 3D models and whatnot. And there was this one um, kid named Colin Levy who was like the blender animation guru online. And he was only like four years older than I was. And he ended up going to SCAD and I was like, ooh, I want to go to SCAD because he went to SCAD. And now he's yeah. got an internship at Disney. Yeah, and he's I worked been on with Blizzard. Really short film. Yeah. Back when I was in SCAD. The one with the plane crashes and everybody like doesn't yeah, make it. Yeah, Flight. No, I didn't work on Flight. I worked on this other one, uh, The Secret Number. It's, it was, he, it he's always a cracked very me talented up. filmmaker. Yeah. He made several really great short films and then he worked at Pixar. And I think he's just trying to be a director now. So. Yeah, he might have left. But, but it was yeah. kind of cool. But like, yeah, he, was he was a guy effects. who taught himself Blender in high school and then decided to come to SCAD to. Uh, get away from the computer a little more and be more of a film uh, uh, hands-on, you know, camera cinematographer. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of there's, no, up there's nothing holding you back, I guess, other than your own creativity, really. That's true. Are there any other questions? All right, yes. You know, that's a great question, and that's what I was just about to get into when it crashed. Um, but let me show you this uh, good old-fashioned uh, map here. Um, so this was uh, where we started. This was our roadmap, right? And uh, this, the drawing on this map, the markers, uh, the handwriting is from the head engineer at the port. So this was his plan, and he showed this to us, and we discussed it, and we, um, you know, Gave him some options, basically, when it comes to price. You know, we had a low, medium, and high version. Uh, you know, and and then they and then we kind of went back and forth. Uh, they 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 changed their mind a little bit, as all clients would. Of like, oh, maybe we don't need to show so many things. You know, and so we tried to you know refine the message a little. Um, and then I and then I created storyboards from this map, um, which is my phone. I just took some pictures and I timed it out to that song. And um, from there, that's where they got the idea to include a hand drawing on the map. Because originally, it was not going to include the map at all. It was just going to be our aerial shots. And then they were like, no, let's include the map, too. So I had this hanging up you know, in my office for a while, uh, along with another map that shows their, uh, it's like the engineering plans. Um, so um, does that answer your question a little? We, we, were, we were very collaborative with the head engineer and Griff Lynch, the executive director of the port, who helped us um, figure out what was important uh, and, and, uh, and help them figure out what was within their budget for the year. So It was like yeah. the, the end game of capital improvement projects. Very exciting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Especially that music. The end game, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Anything else? All right, real quick, so what's happening during lunch? We've got this enormous, scary-looking machine back here, two of them. Um, and I know there's some, like, drones are happening at lunch, carrying away your food. You're involved with that? 
Uh, Alienworks, since part of the DNA of Alienworks uh, to do drones, um, we have uh, our engineer kind of like put together that big uh, drone um, for special applications in the film industry um, uh, to carry a 3D uh, camera. Like, you know, there's two cameras. In order to do 3D, you need two cameras that converge. Um, and that kind of like that was the idea behind it, or, or a big format camera to do the IMAX type of um, image. Um, so yeah, we'll be showing it a little bit. I'm not, I'm not a drone tech whatsoever, so I have no idea. Um, Who is I the drone tech? Uh, there we go, all right. Sean Stevens is our, our drone tech. He's gonna be probably answering questions if you guys have any questions on the drones. And, and that's gonna be out, I think, near the picnic tables at lunch. All right. Yeah, don't ask him. Don't, don't disturb <laughs> well, Mark, him. Mark can also answer a lot of the questions. He, he started all. <laughs> Let the pilot stay focused, right? Yeah, yeah. I, just, I just take care of the image. I just make sure that, you know, the camera is set up correctly and <laughs> <laughs> just back up the image. All right. Well, uh, again, thank you guys so much um, for sharing with us um, what you guys are working on. And thank you all for coming out. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I believe yeah, it's lunch work, and again yeah, yeah. the drones. So be sure to check that out. We'll see you all later today. That was cool, man. That was really Thanks. cool.